I was just reading somewhere where the DNC, they were funding, they're funding in Michigan, a Republican mm -hmm. <laughs> because the other Republican running in the primary is a Donald Trump person. So they're backing, they're putting money behind the opponent of the Trump uh, person. And I'm like, should the DNC be using DNC money to do that, Rachel? Is that good? So like, I have an answer for like right now. And then I have like my, like the normal answer, right? Like the normal answer is definitely no, right? You never really want to play with fire. I'm not a big fan of playing with fire. You know, um, oh, let's hope that Donald Trump wins the presidential nomination because America will never give the presidency to that moron, right? <laughs> like, so like, you know, I mean, because I understand America, unlike many, many people on the left, I understand real America. I never like to give them the option to do crazy shit like that, okay? But here's the thing, I will tell you, like I, you know, I was like thinking, should I complain about that strategy or not? And I looked at, you know, here's the thing. We can, this is this is it. I mean, there's no like there's no next time. All right. It's it's in terms of Congress and at these two elections, 22 and 24, they roll together. Like there is no next time if we don't get it right right here. And so I ultimately I decided that district got redistricted to be more favorable for Democrats. And Meyer was a problem. He's a very, very strong incumbent. Okay. So given that it's going to take a miracle for us to hit 218 in the house. And it will be 218 if we're lucky, right? Then, um, you know, at the end of the day, this is desperate times, desperate measures. <laughs> All right, so break it down. Uh, you are a numbers person and remind people what your expertise is in terms of data analysis as it relates to uh, politics. Sure. Before I left to form Strike Pack, which was a, an effort to lay, you know, use a super PAC to kind of demonstrate messaging reform techniques. Um, I was an academic and at a think tank, and, and my entire national trajectory is based on, on analyzing and, and, and forecasting elections. That's really where I started. It was part of my research agenda at my university. And mostly, I was, um, I was inspired to do it because I would be reading the crystal ball or um, Dave Watt, the Cook political report, or even, you know, Nate Silver or Nate Cohen. And there was no, they did not, they were not they were not, they had not been briefed on the, on how, pol uh, on number one, that polarization, <laughs> because it is a quantifiable characteristic through the public and elites and all these other things, like it's causing behavioral change that causes um, election analysis to, to alter. So I was really motivated to, um, to, to push the conversation up to the reality of, of how polarized pro um, a polarized system functions electorally because it is distinct from what we saw in the 90s or even in the early 2000s. So um, 866-801-8255, I'm going to give out the number because Rachel has been right every time because the numbers don't lie. Numbers don't lie. They just don't, right? Um, I knew spiritually that Trump could win because I know America. <laughs> and I know, <laughs> I know, I know, I know how... Well, of course you do, girl. I mean, come on. You're yes, yes. You know, I, I live in this reason country. you guys know real America better yes, than yes. people need. Black people know. We know. But even black people were in denial. Like, there's no way. Those I'm like 75% of white folks self-segregate. They don't, they they are good with way the way things are. You are crazy if you don't think they would vote for Donald Trump. And I was correct. You were correct because of the numbers. Let's take where we are now. You said 2022 and 24. I think you're absolutely correct. Spiritually, I know you're right. What happens in November will determine what happens in 2024. They are connected, joined at the yes. hip. Now, the Senate and the House right now are in the hands of the Democrat, which the Democrats, which will allow Joe Biden as president to maybe get some things done. I'm, I'm doing like this eh, because the Senate is 50-50, but you got Manchin and Cinema, who are the reverse of rhinos. They are dinos, I guess, Democrats in name only. They do what their um, their handlers and their the benefactors tell them to do. In Joe Manchin's case, the coal industry. So we don't really have 50-50. When I say we, I'm talking humanity, not Democrats and Republicans, because I don't get caught up in political ideology. We don't have 50-50 in the Senate, really. Team democracy. Yep. Team democracy. Okay. Yep. So right now you, you tell us where we are with the house, how many seats are up and what do the numbers tell you is going to happen in November? 
Yeah, no, I'm really happy to. So, and you know, frankly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something a little bit different than I would have told you even 24 hours ago, <laughs> which was, you know, the, so when we think about in the house, we call these midterm elections, by the way, because they happen in the middle of the presidential four year term. Okay, so it's middle of the presidential term and all 435 seats in the House go up every two years. Okay, we can come back on the show one day and talk about how that is actually part of our problem. Okay, um, but only a third of the Senate goes up on each calendar rotation. And this time we're just very lucky that the Senate map is favorable to us potentially picking up seeds, even though the fundamental, which is in party, out party, you know, we have the incumbent president on the Democratic side is against us. And what we learned from the Kansas situation, I was watching the you know, data come in and the activities. This is the first time we've seen Democrats coalesce around effective messaging strategy, hammer it with fear and threat, not you know, bullshit policy stuff and really organize themselves, I think, effectively to win both the, the argument and the, and the, like the heat, right? The passion. So um, what we learned in that was like, I was looking at the day, I was like, maybe they might be able to actually pull this out. Like it will be really close that they can, they might be able to do it. I mean, look at this registration data. And so it's not just that that is not what happened, that they blew it out. I, if we had been seeing them pull it close, maybe they lost by a point or two or they won by a point or two, I'd be talking about how this is the first sign of life we've seen in the electorate. And like, this is a really positive sign for Democrats to beat these fundamentals. But because they whopped their asses so bad with it, like, I mean, it was an ass whopping, dude. That's a good old fashioned ass whopping. It's actually much more suggestive that the energy, the angst factor on the left, because of Roe especially, but also because of the Jan 6 stuff, is high still, very high. And it can be reanimated with the with the right strategy. And that really is what it's going to come down to for us in 2022. The Democratic coalition, which includes our independent leaners, is the one that expands and contracts between presidential cycles and midterm cycles. And I'll just tell you guys, in the data, we see that biggest contraction come from minority voting populations and from uh, young people. But mo now it's more Latino voting because African-American voting pop uh, has gotten so good, right? You guys are killing it because you don't want to fucking live in a shithole fascist hellhole, right? So... Um, <laughs> So in any case, like what, what we're looking at now is a favorable Senate map and potentially the kind of dynamics we would need to hold the House. And these are two holds, guys, that are absolutely critical because you may not love what comes out of Congress, but I can guarantee you if you knew what I knew about polarization and especially the GOP like, um, you know, strategy of opposition government denying the majority any victory, then you would feel pretty good about what they've managed to do with two votes that are, you know, in centrist states or whatever, right? They, they have managed to get quite a bit done considering that we're, we're really trying to hold on to the bag and keep our clothes from falling off right now. So Obama, President Obama was elected in 2008. The midterms happened. The backlash was, we got a black president, let, let's, let's deny him everything, yeah. make him a one-term president, and we're going to now have a strategy. Let's bring these weird people with tea bags on their hats and don't tread on me. Let's, let's galvanize all of the wackos and the races. Let's get them you know, together because we, they, they see the boogeyman now and he's a black man and it happened. And we yeah. told you it could happen that black people are gonna raise up and they're gonna be in power and they're gonna enslave us. And they're gonna yeah. take your children. They're gonna do all of these things. And they're gonna rape people, birth of a nation. They were yeah. right. And people showed up. They got oh, yes. passionate about it and he lost the Congress, right? Yeah. And we, you know, but got reelected, which was interesting, right? And yeah, well, it's because in 2012, you know, Obama was the stomp on the stomp, and he was the he was the thing, right? In 2010, like, and these, you know, luckily, I think the Democratic Party starting to figure this fucking thing out, right? In 2010, they wouldn't let Obama come and campaign instead of leaning in to the fact that that for 50 years we had been trying to reform healthcare. And the moment that Obamacare was signed, 
the system improved for everyone, even if they're too, like, you know, not informed to know it improved for them, okay? And they should have been running on this major monumental achievement for the progressive base, and they should have been tying themselves as closely as possible to, to Obama, because it doesn't matter if, 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 if the opposition says, hey, don't vote for Democrats because they're with Obama and Obama sucks. And then your message is, yeah, God, I don't know that guy. When then what, what you're, you're doing, number one, is you're screwing yourself electorally. But number two, you're reinforcing the Republican branding against you, the party, the president that leads your party. And it's so devastatingly bad to do. Now, Joe Biden's not Barack Obama. Right. By that, I mean... Um... He's not Barack Obama. There's nothing sexy about him. He's gaff, gaff, gaff all day long, get COVID twice, you know, fall off a bike, you know, he'll say some things. <laughs> and his approval rating's in the toilet. So having him out there is not necessarily helpful because so many people look at him as doddering and, you know, a curmudgeon. So how, how you know, so how big is Roe v. Wade? First, let me just stay, stay there. How big an impact is the overturning of Roe v. Wade? Do you, it, do, what do the numbers say, Rachel Bittacoffer? Well, num I will say this too. Number, I put this out on my sub stack if people want to read it. You can do it for free, so don't subscribe unless you have lots of money to waste. Um, but anyway, you can read, and, and I talk about why why is Biden less popular data wise than Donald Trump, right? When by any objective standard, you know, they're <laughs> Biden's doing quite good. He's very stable, and Donald Trump was a hot mess the whole time. And I walk through. Listen, guys, it's because of the of how polarization is asymmetric. So it's much worse on the right than it is on the left, which is why the right is ready to overthrow the government. <laughs> but one of the ways that it matters is on the on the left, we are, there's still a chunk of 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 the of people who would identify with Democrats or lean independent lean towards Democrats who are willing to say, "I'm I'm mad at Joe Biden." OK, that uh, doesn't mean that they won't vote for Joe Biden. It just means that unlike with Republican um, survey respondents, we saw this the entire Trump tenure. It was always 90 percent approved. It doesn't matter what the hell he had done. dude. He could have he could have, you know, burned a village down and he would have had 90 10 approval with Republicans. But when you look at Biden, he's at 80 20. And that's because that polarization, hyperpartisan tribalism is less on this side of the aisle. 866-801-8255. I don't want to, you know, hog, hog up. Uh, right. I love talking to you because, you know, it's uh, straight no chaser. <laughs> you know, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. You're going to get it raw. You're going to get it real. Um, and again, it's about the numbers, you know, so you remove the emotion from it. People can be emotional about what you're saying, but you are looking at data and your data has not been wrong thus far. So, how, what percentage point would you say the overturn of Roe v. Wade will, you know, impact? You talked about Kansas. What I think the best way to explain it, honestly, girls, is this, okay? If it wasn't for the evisceration of Roe v. Wade, something that Mitch McConnell was probably spent all night crying into his pillow about happening, as I tweeted about that night, I was like, there's nobody in America right now more sad about Roe being overturned than Mitch McConnell because it is going to change the dynamics, right? So if it had never happened, ladies, what I'd be I'd be doing now on all my media and everywhere I go is telling people the hard truth, right? It's going to take a miracle. We're probably going to lose both chambers and maybe we can hold on to Michigan and Pennsylvania governorships and have 2024 be a free and fair election if we're lucky. Now, because of Roe, what I suspected was it was going to be of such titan, it had to be a tight. Keep in mind the Jan Six stuff doesn't move public opinion or active. Wait, opinion. pause, pause, and say that because yeah. I've been saying that. I don't yeah. think people give a damn. Everyone is tuning in, and millions of people. There's a lot of numbers of people watching it. Those are there's like a hundred million people that didn't vote, right? So, and yeah. they're not watching it, no. or they're watching Fox, which is spinning it a different kind of way because that's the number. No, they're not even covering it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, the, so, the, the 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 take on the right from all the conservative media ecosystem the whole time for Jan Six commission has been it's a total bunk they can't even find any notable witnesses and that's what they tell their viewers and their viewers who psychologically don't want to be made feel bad they don't go and look to try to prove it wrong right so it, it is you know it, it so, so here's what i will tell you 
The difference with abortion versus Jan 6 is that women personally are affected by that. And, and liberals really hate when I tell them this, but no one's like us, okay? Like ideologically, like we are about 10, 15% of the electorate. And, and therefore like the way to move you two, Jerry and, and Karen, I'm gonna give a message about the collective good and how this is important to do for people who are disadvantaged or whatever, right? Because you care about the collective and can be motivated out of like, regardless of self-interest, but 85% of people, okay, people are less inclined that way than we are number one, and will respond better when it's a me incentive, when it's a direct threat to them or their own in-group. And that's why I tell people as I do this messaging revolution, and especially when audiences like that, like, like, um, like this, what I want to explain to people is like, listen, the, the way the right does their electioneering messaging is it's one mission. There's one mission, win shit, dude. <laughs> okay. And that's why they, they went full racist against Obama. We can see it in the data, racism and sexism, much more than in economic factors detect, uh, determine Trump voting, especially for the de-aligning part of the electorate that could like swung to Trump. So it was racism and sexism, not economics. And um, given that we know about people, like when they want to make an ad, it's about winning shit. When we want to make an ad, we're like, hey, you know, we're, we're trying to win a race, but we also want to make sure we're we, we inc we're including everybody. We got to be inclusive and, and make sure we max representation. And I, you know, is no, I'm a fucking true blue liberal, okay? And I a hundred percent am on team you guys, right? Like in terms of white supremacy, white privilege, all of it, right? But at the end of the day, like we have to move people who don't, who are not us, right? So we should design messaging for one purpose, beating the shit out of the Republican party electorally. We can do messaging that is dual purposed or tri-purposed tri and about inclusiveness and representation when it's, when it's other contexts. But when, it, when it's about moving votes to the polls and for us, especially within that conversion pool, we should be hammering people you know, women are going to die instead of pregnant pe people, people who can become pregnant. I mean, it's six words to say women, right? So we, I mean, I, I, I'm sensitive to those things, but my goal was to make us take the hard medicine because we're facing fascism. So if we can, if we can move voters to the polls by convincing suburban women, which are no longer white women, when I say suburban women, I'm just talking about suburban women, we should, we need to freak them out about their reproductive freedom about their own control of their body about you know having equal uh protection under the law and um you know it is true that the people who are going to suffer are poor women and women of color this is absolutely true but the best way that we can serve them is by beating the shit out of the republicans electorally getting the policy power that we need and then enacting the policies that are gonna make a difference in people's lives. So that's what motivates me and the um, messaging strategies that I bring to bear. Okay, um, so as long as a single individual woman feels like her individual rights are gonna be up for grabs, she's gonna take her ass to the poll no and, shit. Not, and not vote for Donald Trump uh, people. Uh, all right, I got it.